Sambatastico. Hi, this is Edwin Samuelson, and welcome to Not the Cinephiles, but Brunch with the Cinephiles. And today we're joined by a good friend of mine, Mr. David Savage. That's you. That me? Sir, your iced coffee. Thank you. Wow, that looks great. Yeah, uh, yes, it's brunch at the Cinephiles, and today it is actually brunch. Last time we did a brunch, it was dinner time. Yeah, it was more like d uh, dusk with the Cinephiles. Cheers. Currently, cheers, man. Currently, it's Saturday, Thanks Saturday for afternoon. Me. We're in my place this time, and uh, I just made some iced coffee. Iced coffee, obviously, you want to make it the day before so it can cool down for the next day. I prefer to use a sort of uh, dark roast bean, something like an espresso bean, because you want that coffee to be really rich and strong because it's going to get watered down depending upon how you ice it and whether or not you put milk in it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's a little tip. This is something I like to do. Ice. I like to make coffee ice cubes. And remember the last show we did with Nick Schlegel where we talked about cocktails and I talked about a specific kind of ice cube tray? This is the ice cube tray I was talking about. These make large cubed ice cubes and you just have one single large cube in your drink, it melts slowly and it slowly dilutes your drink so you don't lose the flavor, it doesn't water down too quickly. And uh, yeah. And one reason we're indoors is because right now in the middle of New York City, we are in the middle of a extreme heat wave. So what better way to stay cool than with some iced coffee and some uh, bottled water for me. Thank and you And getting much. all hot and bothered talking about gay cinema. Yeah, That's that. right, today's subject is gay and lesbian cinema. And I'm the wrong guy for this, but you know what? I knew he was going to come out of the box and make that claim because but, he didn't want his sexuality questioned I, online. I, I <laughs> tell that to my wife, who is a wonderful woman. Now he's establishing that he has a wife. Well, we have well David, David Savage, our special guest, uh, contributor to Cinema Retro magazine. Some of you have probably heard of it. It's a really good one. And uh, you're also a curator of many screenings here in New York City. In addition to being a, a film journalist for about 23 years, um, I have started being a film programmer. And what I like to do is excavate you know, films that I feel like have been forgotten or unjustly ignored. What are you most proud of introducing to people that they are not familiar with? Like a film that you, just, you saw was great and you introduced it to a new generation of people who really loved it. It's got to be Blue Sunshine um, at Anthology Film Archives. Uh, almost exactly a year ago we did a retrospective, retrospective of three Jeff Lieberman films. Blue Sunshine, Squirm, and Just Before Dawn. And uh, I'd say 75% of our audience was people under 30. And one other film I wanted to mention that I programmed at a little micro cinema in, very scrappy but important micro cinema in Brooklyn is called uh, The Driver's Seat. It was a totally forgotten uh, 1974 Elizabeth Burton in Italy film, uh, a, a sort of an obscure art film that she did with an Italian director by the name of Giuseppe Patrone Griffi, um, based on a Muriel Spark novel called The Driver's Seat. Griefy was a gay, is a gay director, actually he's dead, but he uh, was one of the first pioneering gay directors in, in Italy and kind of a debauched aristocrat, but um, it's a totally camp fest from beginning to end, but it is, has some interesting moments that I thought still carried it and made it, you know, legitimate. Wow. So how'd you get involved with Cinema Retro? How did it all start? Um, my friend Tom Lasanti, who is a very, well-known uh, scholar of 60s beach movies, um, all the <laughs> beach blanket. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just a weird thing to be an expert in, but you know what? God bless him. There needs to be an expert in everything. Uh, well, he's been on TCM. He, he was on TCM for a week last year, uh, introducing all the 60s beach movies you can think of. So Tom was a uh, columnist at Cinema Retro, which is, I have to say, both a magazine that's published in the UK four times a year, as well as a website. Um, so Tom brought me on and introduced me to the editor-in-chief, Lee Pfeiffer, and the, the English editor is in London. His name's Dave Worrell. And Dave and Lee are probably the most well-known Bond aficionados yeah. in the world. If any of you guys out there are Bond fans, you probably know some of Retro. Yeah, it is one of the definitive sources of Bond. And super Bond spy stuff, and your yeah. spy stuff in general, Yes, right? and so that, they realized that, you know, that connects to so many different 60s films and genres and actors and directors. It just 
webs out from there. So they started Cinema Retro about uh, eight years ago or so, 10 years ago maybe. Um, and it's just, you just never run out of material to discuss. And my whole bailiwick is 60s and 70s movies, so. Uh, so now that, that we've introduced you to Dave Savage, check out his articles at Cinema Retro. Uh, if you're in the New York area, keep an eye out for uh, screenings. Is there a way, do you have a, like a Facebook uh, account or something that, that people can just friend you or like you so you get updates on whatever it is you're working mm. on. If you just go to cinemaretro.com uh, you'll see my entire archive of of, uh, of articles and uh, that's where I, you know, that's where my life's, and Index Magazine, I was an editor at Index Magazine for uh, eight years. Did, are you familiar with Index? I, I knew of Index. Index was a, um, a magazine of high and low culture that was founded by the uh, artist Peter Halley in 2000, no, in 1996. And that went all the way through 2005 and I wrote for them. That's where I did a lot of my, my work uh, prior to uh, Vanity Fair and I started working for Vanity Fair. Speaking of uh, brunch, uh, are we hungry? Yes, starving? I'm hungry. Okay, I'm gonna go serve the food. I made a stuffed bread, which is delicious. And I shall grab it. Sambatastico. The bread recipe actually isn't my own. Saw it on an old Jamie Oliver show, that British celebrity chef. This is how you make the dough. You want to take five cups of flour, preferably unbleached, two packages of yeast, two tablespoons of salt, one tablespoon of sugar, a half a cup of olive oil, and about two cups of water. You mix, and it's gonna get into very sticky consistency. Once that's done, put a plastic wrap over that bowl and just set it aside in a warm, dry place and let it rise. In about a couple of hours, check on it. If it's risen, pound it down, knead it. Knead it by taking your knuckles and going from the beginning to the end of the dough and just keep kneading it, and then cover it again and put it aside. The next day, pump up your oven to about the highest point you can, just below boil, because you want your oven really, really hot. That's how you bake bread. Preferably, if you can get one of these things, if you don't have them already, get yourself a baking stone. A baking stone helps intensify the heat even further, so you have that crusty outside of the bread with, with the uh, real bready, doughy in the middle, and it's great for making pizzas with. And the dough I actually uh, just described makes great pizza dough. Roll out your dough with a rolling pin, and once it's rolled out, make sure it's rolled out very, very, very long, almost the length of your counter space. Make sure it's almost a rectangular shape and very, very wide. You want to have about six hard-boiled eggs. You want to have about four or five plum tomatoes chopped in half. I'm also adding into this particular bread marinated asparagus. I love asparagus, not everybody does. You don't have to do this, but something I like to do, I like to marinate it in an olive oil, lemon, salt and pepper mixture, fresh basil, Kalamata olives, preferably pitted, capers, provolone cheese, shredded Parmesan. You want to take the end of your dough, flop it over your eggs and everything, and then take the other end and flop it over the end that you just flopped over your stuffing, and then take your two, the two ends of your bread and try to shape it into a circle, and then attach the two ends. Take your pre-baked bread and just put it in the oven and let it cook between maybe half an hour and 40 minutes. After the half an hour point, take, keep an eye on it because it'll start to burn. But once it's done, take it out of the oven and here you have your baked bread and bon appetit. All right, here we go. Um, technically, you shouldn't have to eat this with a fork. Um, you can it's just, great. it's like a sandwich almost. It's, uh, everything's baked into it, but just in case pieces fall out, you have a fork to eat with. Uh, as you notice, I didn't serve Eddie any because Eddie's it's not. It's finicky. He's a little finicky. He's a little nervous. I'll let him try some off camera. Uh, but right now, this is something Dave and I are going to partake in. Looks great. When you were uh, talking earlier about gay audiences rediscovering films, I think it's very interesting because a lot of films that gay audiences have introduced to new generations of fans. One film that comes to mind, uh, well, when it came out, it was, re was well received, but somehow it didn't really, it didn't become as well known as it did later because of the gay audiences. And I actually was privileged enough to see it with a gay audience, and that film would be Johnny Guitar. Oh, yeah. Which I think is a perfect example. What, what, what is so funny is that how, is how gay audiences respond to the film. Well, um, movies like Johnny Guitar, for example, uh, is so full of uh, these 
sexual and um, well, it's just so full of sexuality and the. Don't mind me. I'm listening. Keep talking. You know, Joan Crawford's uh, epic battle with Mercedes McCambridge is, uh, you know, it's it's like one of the best lesbian battles ever caught on screen. But of course, it's all uh, cloaked in, you know. Um, it's masked by, of course, Joan Crawford has a love interest and Mercedes and Cambridge supposedly has her Beer own for our guest. interest. <laughs> but the, the script is, I mean, to call it campy is just scratching the surface. Um, now, do you think, now there's, there's different, now people somehow say it's intentional camp or it's subtext. No. Do you feel that this, is, this was added to the film intentionally or do you feel no. that people have picked up on this? No. Just True camp is never intentional. Uh, I agree on that. The only way a film can be considered a camp classic is because of the unintentional humor. Uh, because you know the either it's usually the dialogue. Uh, you know, Mommy Dearest, classic example, uh, Johnny Guitar, uh, and Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, the dialogue is overblown. It's very on the nose. Uh, you know. But it could be. The, could it be the dialogue, or could it be the performance of the dialogue? Both. It could, it's an intersection of all those things. Uh, where the every all the elements come together, and for some reason uh, the the audience is laughing, um, you know, at the film, and it's it's not always a bad thing. It actually sometimes uh, prolongs the life of the film. Look at Valley of the Dolls. I mean, that's probably you know it's a barn burner of a film. I would ar argue there's a difference between say the camp whatever you want to call it, of Johnny Guitar versus, say, the camp of, of, of Valley of the Dolls. Because with Johnny Guitar, there, there's an intent behind. It's almost like someone took the idea of a film noir, put it in a Western setting, and gave it color. Well, I think the reason that... And it, so you have all these like weird kind of like mixed approaches, and it's resulted in this strange film called Johnny Guitar. I think that's more of a postmodern reading. Of yeah, because Nicholas, Nicholas Ray was ahead of his time, and he was a good director. The thing about it, I think, that, that brought it to campy is because of the time it was made. Because think about it. It was the 1950s. Westerns, you really didn't see a woman as a lead character in a Western, especially being the tough guy. And, of course, if you have a woman who, you know, I guess Joan Crawford was a really there's, there's some, classy like, lady. There's some Red Scare stuff in there, too. Oh, yeah. yeah of course. Always. First of all, Joan Crawford was on the descent. I just beginning the descent and into B-movies when she made Johnny Qatar. That's already built in, you know, camp material, material already. Um, and it's this epic battle between her and Mercedes McCambridge, who sounds like Rocky the Squirrel in the entire movie. <laughs> uh, and you have Sterling um, Hayden, who is this dr dime store mannequin of an actor who just... Hey, I like Sterling Hayden. I like him too, but he's a, just a serious mannequin, let's face it. <laughs> Um, I like that. So all these elements you know, come together. It's one of my favorite movies. Then there's John Waters. So you take a... Okay, let's say that's true. Yeah. So what do we do with a film like Desperate Living or uh, Polyester or Pink Flamingos or Female Trouble? Clearly, he was making those films, and he is a gay director, I mean, uh, without a doubt. And he has a very gay point of view, I would argue. He was making those films as absolutely outrageous and offensive as possible. Was he make? Was he trying to be camp, or was he just trying to be offensive? I don't. I think the thing about John Waters is that you know the way I look at camp is that his films take place in an alternate universe. What would you, you say would have been a, the earliest representation of a gay character in cinema? I, I, I could think of maybe sort of Pandora's Box. There's a... I say rope. With a Lulu character. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a silent movie, though. Oh, silent movie. Sorry, uh, yeah. She engages with, with another female. There, there's all that stuff about, like, uh, Dracula's Daughter, the sequel to uh, Todd Browning's Dracula, where yeah. they say that she's a lesbian character. Dracula's Daughter. I think it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, horror film, and this has been a topic that has been written about widely. Uh, this There's this brilliant... Uh, writer named Harry Benshoff, uh, who wrote this book called Monster in the Closet. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how horror film, since its beginning, has been encoded with these gay characters that have stood in for the monster. And uh, his work was sort of expanded upon by the, the role of the revolting child in horror film, which have often been stand-ins for gay children, only, you know, 
cross out gay, put in monster or put in demon child, you know. Mm. So, uh, but movies like Dracula's Daughter and... Uh, uh, I think of Frankenstein. Frankenstein M, for example. Mm. Uh, this pursued or uh, this uh, reviled outsider in society that is, you know, this existential uh, uh, villain. Uh, it's... I think it's clear what's being referred to. Yeah, because, you know, so funny, I mean, we had, there were a lot of directors in Hollywood who were gay. Mm-hmm. You know, like... Uh, James uh, Whale. James Whale, Whale would be, probably who had, was the subject of his own movie, Gods and Monsters, Douglas Sirk. Um, you know, there were a lot of... The thing about a lot of gay directors, they were very creative people. Yeah. Curtis Harrington, who we mentioned earlier. Curtis Harrington, who I think was probably one of the most prolific uh B directors of the 70s and 60s, made a lot of very interesting high art horror films. Yeah. We started to see an introduction of films that would start to sort of tackle the subject head on. We, we talked about advice and consent in uh, one of our episodes. Tea and sympathy. Tea and sympathy. Um, so now we move in to like, like the late 60s, right? And, and, and it now it's starting to become a little more explicit. The boys in the band. Boys in the band. Uh, it's a certain extent, I guess, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Right. Uh, the Killing of Sister George. The killing of Sister I George. I love that movie. The 80s is when we really saw Hollywood for the first time making films with gay, um, gay characters. Yep. Uh, we've talked just very briefly about Cruising. There was also that same year a film that I mean I consider pretty offensive, but it's very entertaining. The film Windows. Oh, which yeah. was a lesbian point of view. Yeah. Then we had Making Love with Michael Ondekeen, which was kind of an interesting film. It's not yeah. very good. Uh, a, a little before that, I forgot, was a movie called A Different Story. And then we also had uh, a film called Partners by James, uh, I think, uh, Burroughs, who also did Cheers with John Hurt and uh, Ryan O'Neill. And it was kind of a comical version of Cruising where a cop is trying to catch somebody, so they assign him a partner who is gay, played by John Hurt. And like let's 70s. not forget Personal Best. Personal Best, which was with a, Meryl Hemingway, and that was an, then that's an unusual film because yeah. it was uh, written by written and directed by Robert Town. It was produced by an openly gay man, which was uh, David Guffin. Sadly, it did not set the world on fire. But what's interesting is that you had a lot of these gay themed films, but none of them really left the mark or made a lot of money. The only one that really has set the test of time is Cruising, because that's the one we're still talking about today. I don't know. I. I don't know if I well, would agree with that. Well, some circles are talking about cruising. Let, let's be realistic. We have Al Pacino in it. That's a pretty well, high it's profile. Al Pacino, but, but a lot of people, you got to understand, you're, you're, we're talking to a film fan audience here. If you talk to the regular sh- Joe, I, I guarantee a lot of people are going to be like, what's this cruising film? Well, I'm not saying, it's, I'm not saying it's how well known, but of all the ones yeah. I just mentioned, um, I think that's the most well known. It was very controversial, as was Personal Best. Uh, very controversial because, I mean, you could name on one hand the number of... Uh, openly lesbian films that were released by studios, uh, you know, up until 1980. That might have been too. I think Personal Best was made too because we had a couple of very famous gay athletes who were female come out, yes. one of which was uh, Martino Navratilova and the other one was Billie Jean King. The thing too, Personal yeah. Best is a movie. It's not focused on the gay aspect. It's, it's, it's focused on something else, whereas, you know, other films, you know, it was all about we're promoting this as this deals with gay relationship. Well, isn't this controversial? That's why you're going to want to see this. Personal Best is a little bit different from those other films, and that that wasn't. That was just ha- the character just happened to be gay. It was. It wasn't the main point of the story. Right. Because we had a whole period during the '90s, you know, the whole Sundance indie movement, and you had all those guys coming like Swoon, all these films that came out. Todd Haynes, Gus Van Zandt. Right, and they not only addressed the issue of being either gay or lesbian head on, but they were explicit in how they addressed it. And they had very subversive points of view. I mean, uh, I always think the Europeans handled homosexuality much better than the US in terms of filming. Like one director we were talking about earlier was Fastbinder, who did Corral. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a film I cannot imagine being made in America, even though it At that time, a film like that. At that time, no. Greg Araki. Uh, with his stuff. What was his first film? Uh, the Doom Generation. Doom Generation, Doom Generation, stuff like that. Totally fucked up. That, that dealt with gay, bi, you know, the whole nine yards. Sadly, I mean, it's you a had a whole bunch of Todd Haynes. I mean, you had all these people coming in yeah. uh, during that period of time that were just, just tackling on, head on. Well, and, you forgot right. probably the most prolific and most famous of these, these new wave of gay directors. Mm-hmm. By the way, I think Greg Araki sucks. Uh, Gus Van Sant. Yes. Gus Van Sant, of course, uh, made uh, uh, Drugstore, Drugstore Cowboy. Cowboy, which really wasn't that gay. Mala Noche. Yeah. And then he did, of course, the one, the film that really, 
I think is probably a pretty daring film for its time. It was an independent film, My Own Private Idaho. That's a key that's film a pretty, in gay cinema. That's a pretty big uh, film in gay cinema. And then, unfortunately, he tried to do the lesbian version a couple of years later, and it's an absolute piece of shit. Even cowgirls get the blues. Oh, yeah. Uh, they have nothing to do with each well, other. Well, I'm saying doing another, uh, again, another gay film. That's well, but, uh, cowboy get, well, cowgirls get the blues is dealing with the character was just bi. She was sleeping yeah. with everybody. Whereas, whereas My Own Private Idaho just dealt specifically with two gay characters. It was in itself, it was an updating of Henry V. Mm -hmm. Or Henry IV, it's parts one and two, moving into Henry V. That's, that's I didn't what, know that. Yeah, but you had a period, I mean, the point being that you had a period where all these gay filmmakers were stepping up to the plate. Yeah. And uh, starting to address these issues head on uh, the way they felt they should be addressed. Some but, of them were yeah. more explicit than others, but they were being addressed. And would you say that that would be like, I don't know, a golden era, a gay lesbian I think filmmaking. So. Yeah. I don't think because you're not gonna, you don't see anybody like that coming up. The only the new gay directors, well, they're not even really that new. I mean, one of them is Brian Singer, but he's not making any gay subject films. Uh, even though he are. says that you know there's gay subtext in X Men. I think that the whole thing we're seeing is that you know now the issue isn't about just plain visibility. You know, it's now now that gay life is is now out in the open. We've repealed DOMA and all these things. Uh, issues are now more about domesticity, monogamy, living together, the problems of relationships. It's, it's mirroring the society that we're living in, you know? It's, uh, you mentioned something off camera, maybe elaborate for us on camera. You see this affecting creativity, subversiveness? I, sub something? Subversion. I, I think one of the great gifts that gay cinema has given society is a subversive viewpoint. And uh, while I realize that, you know, all films have to, are all films are mirroring the society they come from. Uh, I hate to see gay films lose that subversive perspective because there is still homophobia out there. You know, people still dislike gays, let's face it. And uh, uh, We don't. Well, I know you don't, but and you wouldn't have me here otherwise. But I'm saying because, Get out. because yeah. homophobia persists, um, it always presents an occasion to critique society and, and, uh, and homophobic stereotypes. I have a question. Is there a difference between gay cinema and lesbian cinema? Mm, I would say the difference is between gay men and, and lesbians. Uh, uh, yes and no. Uh, they're both... Uh, I mean, let's, let's, let's focus on lesbian cinema. I mean, yeah. We talk about Killing a Sister George. Right? Killing a Sister George. And Moving further, much Desert closer Hikes. to the present, you know, something like Go Fish. Go Fish. And then there were Personal best, let's not forget that. Personal you know, best, right. The Watermelon De Woman. Desert Hearts uh, with uh, Helen Slater. Oh, that's right. That oh, I forgot about that one. Very, yeah. very important film in, in, in lesbian cinema. Uh, that. Oh, Bound? Bound, yeah. I mean, these are landmark films where, yeah, I mean, the mandate of them, there's a pun, is uh, visibility, <laughs> but also that's also a telling telling, the les made of them. telling lesbian story. Go fish! You mentioned that telling the lesbian story, which is not often told, is the you know, is the mission. A lot of the, a lot of those films. Uh, the difference between gay and lesbian film is lesbian films have a preponderance of acoustic guitar soundtrack, and gay ma male films is all like throbbing synthesizer. Would you agree with that? Now, when we talk about gay cinema, there is no monolithic. There's gay no cinema. monolithic gay no. cinema. No. That I mean, first of all, I am totally indebted to people like Vito Russo for you know getting down on paper the entirety of gay cinema, at least American. Uh, so I mean, we owe him Both a huge the book tip of the hat. And the documentary, yes, are absolutely. very good. Solo a Closet, Solo really, a Closet really good. is like the landmark scholarly work about gay cinema. Um, but there is no monolithic gay cinema. It's uh, a, a total like mosaic of different countries, uh, subgenres. Uh, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh. Being a gay man, mm. was there a specific film growing up, you know, where you said, "Okay, this is this is speaking to my experience," or somehow, uh, "Wow, I'm amazed at this film." And doesn't necessarily have to be a gay film, but something that 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 kind of like you felt empathized with your point of view. Dorian Gray, I think Dorian Gray is uh, is a very Dorian Gray was the mm. film. Now, what was it about that? that mm. Well, the story obviously the Oscar Wilde uh, source material is, 
is very interesting. You know, a man wanting to preserve his age uh, and, you know, makes this sort of Me Mephistophelian pact to preserve his age. And it's all in th in th this portrait of a very superficial person who manages to uh, preserve his age and in, in his, uh, in his, is keeping up this social status that is so important to him and uh, everyone around him is aging and it just seems to be an extremely uh, intrinsically gay story and uh, but you know I have to say there haven't there haven't been that many overtly gay films that spoke to me so much as films that had gay characters in them well was there a film that, that, that came out where you're like okay thank god this speaks to my experience or something like okay. that okay Suzanne Plachette's character in The Birds, she is clearly a lesbian. Clearly. There's that scene between Tippi Hedren when she goes to have her first real girl-to-girl -girl conversation with Suzanne Plachette in The Birds. There are all these indicators. I have to credit Camille Paglia for tipping me off to this. Because, let's, fo let's face it, Annie, played by Suzanne Plachette, is a lesbian. Uh, she... She's a pre-Stonewall lesbian. She's got the haircut, the cardigan. She's kind of butch. She has all this like abstract art on her walls. And her whole home decor speaks of like, you know, life back east before I moved to California. And she, you know, she just has this real dikey, you know, fifth, late 50s dikey look. And, uh, and she has to pay for it. Her eyes get pecked out, you know. Um, she has to die, you know, that's, Wow. If any of us existed in a 1950s or 60s horror film, we'd all be dead within the first reel. <laughs> I hope so. <sighs> I so, be. wrapping up mm. uh, what we're doing here, we really want to thank David Savage for joining us on this really hot day. It is so hot. The air conditioning is on in my apartment, and we're still sweating, mostly because of lights and stuff, but it's pretty hot outside. So, uh, would it be appropriate to uh, mention oh, the mimosas, uh, a cliche brunch drink if there ever was one? It's very simply sparkling wine and orange juice. Eddie when, calls them manmosas. Yeah, when they, when, they, uh, when they say champagne, <laughs> champagne is a sparkling wine made from grapes made in the Champagne region of France. So, if it's not grapes from Champagne, France, then it's not champagne. If it's from Italy, it's Prosecco. Anywhere else, it's sparkling wine. And this is a Prosecco. Uh, and in my kitchen, it's just called a hooch. But, it's good. Yeah, uh, booze. I have to apologize for any inaccuracies I spouted. Uh, we'll correct it in the edit. There you go. Uh, Cheers, gents. Cheers. Thanks for having Again, me. Lesbian Thanks. Cinema to David Savage for joining us for Cinema Retro. Check out uh, the website. Thanks for the plug. Um, and uh, keep keep an eye out for any future. <laughs> keep an eye. Hey, guy, it's the show. It's that's what it's about. Uh, keep an eye out for any future updates on any uh, curated events on Davis Park. I'll be tomorrow. pumping you for information. There you go. <laughs> oh my God. Aren't you gonna make some sort of like double entendre remark? You know, to make Edwin feel incredibly uncomfortable on camera when you said it. I mean, every time the camera stops, someone says something that is glaring gay, double entendre, like, how big is your sausage? And referring to the sausage in, uh, in Eric's uh, thing. But the thing was, Eric. there was no sausage in my thing. <laughs>